Good evening, everybody. So I want to talk about just kind of push politics to the side and commentary to the side. And I want to talk about something very different. And it's what I am doing in university. So um, oh, I don't really like this. I like the hugs. I don't know. <laughs> but um, so in my university, of course, as you know, I'm doing a master's in international human rights law. So that's an LLM in international human rights law. And at the end of the master's, so my master's program is like one year. And so at the end of the master's, toward the end, um, we are required to submit a dissertation. And I'm very excited about submitting my dissertation. Um, I feel like I, I got a grasp of actually writing dissertations, just some experience in the past with the publication, uh, the Shariaization of Ireland's Direct Provision Institution and its impact on transgender asylum seekers. That was not necessarily a dissertation. It was a working paper that I hoped would be published, but of course, there was a lot I didn't know about um, publishing at that time. And uh, I, I still think that the paper, the research in the paper is necessary and a reflection of not only uh, the experiences of marginalized community, <laughs> excuse me, marginalized communities within direct provision, but also whether or not NGOs and human rights institutions are serving the public the way that they should be served. And so I had a meeting with my supervisor because every student is assigned, well, we're not assigned a supervisor, but we're given a list to where we can actually pick our own supervisors. And I did pick a supervisor and I picked someone who I felt was knowledgeable or at least I, I would say that that she would give me authentic support and that, that she would guide me in the best way to ensure that what I write is a very um, professional and critical and well thought out piece of work. And we had a conversation about my topic, of course, as you know, I am going to be doing my dissertation on transnational repression. And it is something that I thought about for quite some time. And we had a conversation about whether or not, whether or not I should question or, or whether or not the experiences of, of what person uh, a Black person experiences abroad, whether or not that should be deemed transnational repression, it, it, whether or not that, that should be deemed transnational repression, whether it should be called something else like uh, an ordinary human rights violation. And so I contemplated on that because I thought that that was a very important question and way to look at my research. And so uh, this, that got me thinking like, like, is this a typical human rights violation? Like, should this just be, not be called transnational repression or should this be called transnational repression? Like, is this, should this be called something other than transnational repression? Or is this transnational repression? And so I thought about it over, and so I think I spoke with her yesterday. And yeah, so yesterday afternoon, afternoon I spoke with her. And today I had some time to really contemplate on that question. And I decided that this is transnational repression, that I am going to be calling this transnational repression, that I am going to be doing my research around the subject of transnational oppression. That's what I decided. And I think it's very important to call it transnational repression because it's quite unfortunate that when other groups go through it, so for example, if 
uh, an activist coming from a Middle Eastern country is experiencing it and they are in a de democracy, it is called transnational repression. And when a African is going through it and they are in a democracy, it's called transnational repression. But when a Black American is going through it and they're in a democracy other than the United States, it's not called transnational repression. And I need to understand why that is. That is something I'm going to be exploring. Like why in all these other cases, are we calling it transnational repression? But when Black Americans, ooh, excuse me, but when Black Americans go through it and experience it, we have to give another name to it. We have to call it something different. And so I personally, in my dissertation, in my research, I'm not going to be calling it anything different. I will be calling it transnational repression. I think it's important to keep the phenomenon uh, going, well, not necessarily keep the fun phenomenon going, but to build on the research that is already available uh, on transnational repression. We know that, yes, uh, Dana Moss has, I, I believe she coined the term transnational repression. And for that, I think that diaspora communities, activists, human rights defenders, journalists is forever grateful for, for actually giving it that name. And I really want to explore this topic ethically and professionally and intelligently. And so I wanna keep these experiences under that, that uh, phenomenon, transnational repression, so that it makes sense to scholars, so that it makes sense to uh, teachers, so it makes sense to human rights activists, human rights organizations. This is transnational repression, and I want to really build on this research. And I am not calling it transnational repression because I just really want to stick it to the U.S. or stick it to Ireland. No, I'm calling it transnational repression because that is what happened. That's what they did. And they had an opportunity like 10 or 15 times, 10 or 15 opportunities, open opportunities that I actually gave these two countries 10 or 15 times. I gave it to them to say, let's sit down and talk about this and let's sit down and really have a really unique and confidential discussion because this is a unique topic. Let's have let's sit down and have explore this and have have a conversation about this. So, if this is you, then if it, excuse me, if this is not you doing this, then that brings clarity and this can help me to understand that. Okay. You're not, United States, you're not doing it, Republic of Ireland, that you're not doing it. So what is happening is vigilantism and vigilantism that is tied to people in power, right? And so if that vigilantism is tied to people in power, now that was vigilantism in the Republic of Ireland, but now that I'm in a different state, that's transnational organized crime because now we still have groups that are still engaging in it. And then when you, when you try and report it to law enforcement, law enforcement is very complicit and they're not actually saying anything about it. So this, the, it broadens my understanding in several ways. First, it, it lets me know that these, uh, so the colluders of this phenomenon are given impromptu to engage in this practice. To this practice, uh, I, I, law enforcement and certain uh, groups are acquiescing to it. So they're actually, 
giving it their stamp of approval. They're saying that it's okay. They're saying that this is permissible. You can do this to this human rights defender and we're not going to say anything about it. And I think that that is worth exploring in my dissertation to really understand why when Black Americans abroad, because I'm pretty sure, I mean, I'm not the only person that has gone through it. I just think maybe I'm the only Black American that was able to identify it. But I think what's important is really raising the question, right? Why are, why, I, I think the question that should be raised is, why is it transnational repression when we are talking about states that are outside the global north, right? So when we're talking about the global south states and we're, we're talking about foreign nationals coming from the glo global south and they're ex experiencing repression abroad, why is that called transnational repression? But when you have Black Americans from the global north abroad and they're experiencing repression, that's not transnational repression. Why, why, why are we saying that that's not transnational repression? And so I, I think that that is a question worth exploring, something I'm going to be looking into. And like, I'm excited. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to really just kind of really delve deeply into this topic. I know it is a frightening experience. And of course, I've gone through it for four years, but if I don't actually take this opportunity and write intelligently and critically on it, then my oppressors are going to call it something else. They're going, they're going to, they're not going to stop. And I'm pretty sure that even if I publish this research, it's going to, perhaps it'll make them even angrier. I'm not sure, but it's important for me not to stop my, it's important for me to continue with my research and continue with my goals. And I know that, uh, authority figures, uh, toxic authority figures are, are going to get in the way of that and, and continue to do so. But, but I would urge them to really spend their time doing something else. Like there's so much crime going on in this world. Like there's like, I, I'm, I'm looking at the news every day and there's always an incident where law enforcement, you know, you know, in, in the city that I I'm, I'm in, in the Republic of Ireland, in the United States, law enforcement, they're looking for, for people. They can't find them for weeks and they should be spending their time really focused on those serious crimes than trying to stop activism and people who are speaking out against human rights violations. So that's just my, my opinion. But I'll end it here. And um, so that's what I'm going to be doing. And I hope you wish me luck. Thank you. Bye.